On the streets, my brother's dying. And I hear the mothers crying, crying out. And the way that things are going. What, what they found when they reviewed 114 organic or near organic projects, agroecological projects, in 24 African countries, they looked at 2 million hectares, 1.9 million farmers, that the average crop yield was 116% for all of Africa. Here in East Africa, 128%. Now, I just want to explain a few things about this. This is starting from um, a baseline of, of what we call traditional systems, or as Bo talked about, organic by neglect. But when we go from that to good organic management, organic by design, we talk about 100% increases. Why is this relevant? Well, the majority of food insecure people live in the developing world. Honestly, it doesn't matter how much we increase the yields in the USA or Australia or um, other, other countries that do broad acre, it makes no difference to these people. Where we have to increase the yields are in the developed countries. In other words, if we want to get food security in Africa, we increase yields in Africa. And we can do it. And that's what I want to talk about and actually show you how to do it. The other thing I want to say too, and this is really critical, the report notes that since the 1960s, when what we, what we now call chemical intensive industrial agriculture was first introduced into Africa, there was 10% less food per person in Africa now than 50 years ago. Now, I would argue that that experiment after 50 years has failed. Business as usual is a failure, and trying to push it, it's about, it's really making a dead cat bounce. We need, as Hans has said, we need system transformation if we're going to feed this world. Let's look at it. And where I want to start with is the fundamentals of system transformation. Soil health. It starts in the soil. The, the soil is the greatest area of biodiversity in this planet. All agriculture starts in the soil. We have to get it right. Most pests and diseases are actually opportunistic. They attack plants that are stressed or sick. We know that if we can correctly balance soils, we get minimal diseases, minimal pests. Um, what we know is these soils are rich in organic matter, beneficial organisms, nutrients, have a good structure. The, we also know that they will are the asset to so many weeds. Now in Africa there's two major weeds here, spread or striper, parasitic weeds, I don't know how to pronounce it, another one is uh, imperative grass, which is known as pipe grass, plant grass, there's lots of different names. They are major weeds. You know what they are? They are indicators of poor soil. We have enough evidence now, we correct the soil, they just disappear. We don't need herbicides, we need good soil management. And I want to give you some examples here in Africa. This is Ethiopia. And this is part of the Tigray. Um, project. And here you can see wheat. It's the same strain of wheat. It's grown on the same soil. There's nothing separating them. The difference is one was treated with compost, the other with good chemical fertilizers. The one that was treated with chemical fertilizers has ended up getting stripe rust. It needs to be sprayed with fungicide. So if you look at that one, um, the only reason they get a crop now is that they have to spray with fungicides. And I want to get this across because this is what has happened to agriculture. With the introduction of chemical fertilizers, we now need toxic chemicals to protect the plants to get the yields. Without them, yields crash. The composted wheat required no fungicide and, and have a look. We've got 6.5 tonnes a hectare as against the 1.6 tonnes of 
the Kempton Fertilizer Group. This is my own farm. I'm a farm. I've been farming for more than, you know, close to 50 years. An organic farm, agroecological farm. And one of my crops are papaya. And we get a, a, a bug that is a severe pest, and all the conventional industrial farms fought for years to keep endosulfan, one of the, the last of the DDT family, a chemical that, that causes horrendous birth defects in children. I said, oh, without it, we can't grow. I want you to look at it. You see the damage lower down. You look up and you see the papyrus forming. Now, what I did there is fix up the soil health. No sprays, no poisons, and dealt with one of the worst pests. Let's, now, because I haven't got, now I've only got a short time. I can't go into a lot of detail, but I just wanted to get across. If you get the soil health right, trust me, that's 95% of your problem solved. The other 5% we can start looking at agroecology. And I want to introduce a word called functional biodiversity. This is where we bring in biodiversity in the system that gives us ecosystem services. In this case, I want to talk about pest control, controlling pests. What we know is that many of our beneficial insects <laughs> are the natural enemies of our pests. Uh, need a range of plant hosts. And many of them actually have to have nectar and pollen. A lot of them actually, <laughs> it's their, their adult stages are actually their babies, they live on, on um, pollen and nectar. Or they need it actually to, to become sexually, sexually reproduced. But it's their larval stage that is the predator. And you see here what happens is with these beneficial insects, the, the light beings, they feed on nectar and pollen and then you can see how they, they lay their, their eggs in or on pests like caterpillars and then the larvae feed on the pests and kill them. If you don't have flowers in the system, if you do what most industrial systems are, you spray everything out with, with Roundup, you, you nuke everything apart from your cash crop, you have nothing there for these beneficial insects. Anyway, they're probably being killed by the pesticides you spray anyway. But if one goes in um, and doesn't get killed by pesticides, it'll die of starvation because it doesn't have the nectar. So, you know, when I learned that, I redesigned my system. As an organic farmer, I used to use organic sprays. But then when I started to learn from various universities, I started to redesign my own farm. This is my own farm, and you can see um, flowers under my trees. My neighbours wonder why I keep all these weeds. I just think it looks very nice to have flowers under my trees. I, I like it. And they provide nectar, pollen, mating sites, refuges, and you know another thing they do? They suppress weeds. We talk about functional biodiversity. I'm adding, I'm getting multiple functions. This is research that I'll actually I learned from in the United States, went out and, and did various professors and people took me out to, to, to different farms and showed me different models where people are planting the, the host plants as um, barriers or, uh, around their farms. Another thing you can do is strip mine. Instead of turning your place into a neat park and garden, is actually leaving um, lots of flowering plants as refuges. By doing that, you dramatically increase the amount of beneficials in your system. So this is my orchard again. And you see, I'm leaving tall areas with, with multiple flowering plants. And they're uh, refuges. And it's a bit like high rises. The, the higher you make multi-story buildings, the more people you can keep in it. It's the same with these. So I don't mow my in one go. I do it in stages. I always leave a strip. So it's always a refuge for beneficials. Later on I'll know that but another area has grown up. This is Myanmar and you see here a simple way is to plant something like sunflowers as a border. They attract the pests and what happens is the beneficials are in there eat them before they get through to devour the, the crop. This is here in Kenya, and it's taken out 
to have a wonderful day thanks to Colm taking up to organic farmers many years ago when I first became high farm president. Never forget the day and never forget the, my, my colleagues, fellow farmers here. And these borders here have the potential, if properly managed, to give multiple ecosystem services that provide habitat for birds, frogs, beneficial insects, that act as barriers saw with the sunflowers, windbreaks, with the right species of stock food, legumes, and sustainable harvest that we can use for compost and, and biogas. The similar thing in Myanmar, and when we looked at this we also found botanical insect, insecticides in it. But with a little bit of redesign in these sort of neglected areas, suddenly can um, become highly functional. The, the word we actually use is eco-function intensification, where we now bring biodiversity into our system to increase the ecosystem services, the functions we get. Now this is my own farm, and I took this picture because I wanted to illustrate exactly how this works. Now, the reason I took that, I wanted to show you sunlight, this is a legume. Now, I'm regarded as a messiest farmer because I don't use Roundup and I'll let all these big weeds go up my trees. You know, how can I let my place go rack and ruin like this? Let's start looking at it from an ecological and scientific point of view. What I'm doing now is maximising solar capture of my farm. What are we doing with my farm? We're capturing solar energy using photosynthesis to provide products, fruit, nuts, grains, or feed for animals, milk, cheese, meat. But it all comes from photosynthesis. What we want to do is capture every drop of it, every photon. This is photosynthesis that my fruit tree is using. I'm using that now to power my ecosystem services, so we're using solar energy. This is a crop called Rambutan. I just want to say I used to export all around the world, particularly to Japan. And Japan, uh, the Japanese are the fussiest consumers you'll ever deal with. You have to have absolutely perfect fruit. I produce pretty well absolutely perfect fruit without using a pesticide through the system. So, this is a vine that fixes nitrogen. I don't need any nitrogen fertilizer. It's doing it with the biology. Because don't get the air is 78% nitrogen. It is putting soil carbon in, which is really important to feed the biology and nutrients. I haven't got time to explain it but, uh, here, but the best way to improve the nutrients in the soils that grow crops, roots put nutrients in. Don't, and don't remove if you do it properly. I've got green manure stock there. I'm a great believer in integrated stock animals at the moment. I've got cattle, but in the past when the trees are smaller, I had geese. The flowers, and you can't really see them here, but there's flowers all through your different species attract the beneficial insects. I get my pest control for free. Living mulch. This idea, oh, the weeds can put people in water, actually it's the other way around, they shade. We actually know there's a thing called the cloud stripping effect. Plants that strip water at night time that's in the atmosphere and add it to the soil. They increase the moisture. They shade the soil so it's cooler, the roots grow. I live in lowland tropics, I live in a climate like, like, like Mombasa or Zanzibar. The, so it shades so it keeps in moisture. For me, this is good management. That's how I manage my farm. This is an example of a similar one with apricots in Italy. You can see all the flowers down there. Remember the field day going there, and most people were horrified that this woman, this farmer, she let all the place go to rack and ruin. But it's the same thing again. It's not the crops getting the sunlight first, and the extra sunlight now is using the same ecosystem services as you saw on my place. This is what we want for management. Now let's go over to what is regarded as best practice management of orchards in um, much of the world and in industrial agriculture. Let's have a look at that. Minimal solar capture. More solar energy is going on baking the bare ground, killing all the microorganisms, than is 
being used by the crop. There's no fix of nitrogen, that's sort of dead. So you have to, have to use nitrogen fertiliser, buy it. If you don't, with this system, if you don't put in nitrogen fertiliser, you've got no nitrogen. There's no green manure or anything like that to, to build up fertility, so you have to buy it and bring it in. No flowers to attract beneficial insects, so you have to use pesticides. Without it, you don't get a crop. And they do that, as I say, it conserves water, but it's the other way around. It doesn't conserve water because the heat causes what's called capillary action, causes the moisture to evaporate out of the soil. If you go there and put your hand in, you're looking at dust. Go back to my place under the same heat, and the soil is moist and full of life. And this soil is subject to wind and soil erosion. So they're actually losing the most valuable um, product, the most valuable thing on Earth, topsoil. It's a few centimeters of topsoil that we all depend on. So this is what I want to end on now. And there will be people here speaking about push-pull, push-pull actually started here in Kenya and was under Dr. Hans Heron when he was head of the city here in Nairobi that he set it all up. And push forward to me one of the, the greatest examples of getting science to work on, on transformation. I'm not going to go and explain to you how it works in corn, but what I want to say here is that um, what's happened with push pull is other people have looked at it and said, Oh, look, um, if it works in maize, in corn, you know, for instance, in Ethiopia, they said, look, it's going to work on teff or sorghum or millet. And it did. And then someone else says, I oh, wonder if it's going to work on tomatoes. And it did. And chilies. And it did. And so it's taken out. The first one is a, is a mango orchard where they brought in the desmodium, um, alfalfa, loosened depending on what you want to call it. Um, desmodium repels pests, suppresses weeds. Uh, alfalfa and, and desmodium both host beneficial insects, bring in the good guys, and the other one, napier grass, traps the pests. I haven't got time to explain it, but here you've got a system where you've got a pest control, and I can tell you those mangoes, uh, I, they had, I love mangoes and had trouble getting me out of there, they were so good. And the farmer, whose farm, and she now is technically a millionaire, and uh, she employs her husband, who was actually chief of police in the, in the local town, but earned more money working with, for her on her farm. The, the other thing I, you know, I like about too is that the way to control this is bringing cattle, and they graze it down, so you now have got meat, milk, uh, and using the manure, they, they've got their biogas for all their power and then the biogas slurry used for compost. It's a highly productive system. And it's the same with this chili one. So that's what I, what, what, what I want to talk about here is that for the people who, who doubt it, this revolution is happening. System change is happening. And a lot of this innovation is case of push pull started by good scientists, we're now seeing farmers adapting it and moving it forward. And this is what we need to do. We need this partnership between some researchers and farmers, but also to allow farmers to look at how to make these things work better and scale it up. And we do that, we can feed the world, feed it well without any toxic pesticides. Thank you.